when we're born, we sign on to the world without looking at the fine print. When you look at the fine print, you see what it says. The world is swept away. There's no one in charge. Offers no shelter. Has nothing of its own. It's a slave to craving. It's a dangerous place. But we signed on to this world because we're dangerous people. Our minds are very undependable. As I said last night, the Buddha said even he couldn't think of an analogy for how fast the mind is to change direction. And yet it keeps making, making decisions, creating karma, again and again and again. This is what we need refuge from. Now, karma comes in lots of different kinds, and it's dangerous in lots of different ways. There's our own karma, and there's the karma of other people. Our own past karma, our own present karma. Skillful karma, unskillful karma. We need refuge from all these things. We need a place of safety. And it were driven by bewilderment. As the Buddha said, that's one of our reactions to, to suffering. We're bewildered inside. We don't know what's going on. And we look outside for help. And so we need refuge in both dimensions, both inside and out. And the refuge provided by the Buddha takes care of both dimensions, first with regard to outside. The Buddha himself provides a, an example for how to live life in a way that actually puts an end to suffering and finds safety. He teaches the Dharma for anyone who's interested. And we have the example of the Noble Sangha to say that it wasn't just the Buddha. People of all kinds, if they follow the practice, can find safety too. Now all of this is external, as John Lee used to, to say, if we hold to this refuge only on the external level, what have we got? The Buddha died more than 2,500 years ago. The Dhamma is in books. As for the Sangha. You look around, you see there are all kinds. What you've got to do is take what's good in the external level and bring it inside. Now the external level is there to remind us not to listen to anything that goes against what the Dharma has to say, because there are other external influences. Lots of people with lots of ideas who act in lots of ways that we take as examples. So at the very least, he gives us an outside standard. But we can hear the outside standard. We can even recite the passages, taking refuge. But again, the mind is capable of changing so quickly. This is why we have to internalize it. And we do that through the practice of mindfulness. We establish mindfulness, say, in the body in and of itself, or an aspect of the body like the breath. We try to be ardent, alert, and mindful. We put aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Now that these, this world outside that we've been taking as our, as our standard, we've got to put that aside for the time being, just look inside. The mindfulness is what remembers the Dharma. The alertness is what watches what we're doing. And the ardency is what tries to bring that Dharma into being inside. You know, as we, you're dealing with body, feelings, mind. 
things right here, things you've been identifying with. And it's like you're taking these qualities of the Buddha, the teachings of the Dharma, and you're steeping your body, steeping your feelings, steeping your mind in those qualities. So that each time you sense yourself breathing in, breathing out, you remind yourself, oh yeah, there's the Buddha, there's the Dharma, there's the Sangha. These things become embedded in your, in your breath, become embedded in the way you deal with the feelings in the body, the way you deal with your mind. And this protects you from engaging in unskillful actions. So it brings refuge one step inside. And it protects you from unskillful actions on two levels, both the things you're doing now and the things you've done in the past. The immediate focus, of course, is what you're doing right now. But you also begin to realize that the reason you're suffering right now is how you take things coming in from the past and relate to them. So the Buddha is teaching you to relate to them in a good way. Remember that image of the, the salt crystal? If you make your mind unlimited here in the present moment, then no matter how bad the karma is from the past, it doesn't have to have an impact on the mind. In other words, you may have the physical results of past actions that were unskillful, but the mind doesn't have to suffer from them. As you enlarge your mind, you enlarge it through the concentration, you make it unlimited through the practice of the, the Brahma Viharas. Goodwill for everybody, compassion for everybody, empathetic joy for everybody, equanimity for everybody when it's needed. That enlarges your mind, and the enlarged mind suffers a lot less than the narrow, constricted mind that is constantly worried about this, worried about that, overcome by pain. You train the mind in virtue, you train it in discernment, so it doesn't have to suffer from things. You train it not to be overcome by pleasure or pain. You do that through the concentration. You can sit here, and everybody's had this experience. You start out meditating, and there's a pain here, and there's a pain there, and you, your immediate impulse is to get up and run away. But instead you learn to sit with it, and over time you become less and less afraid of the pain. and also more skilled in dealing with it. You can breathe through the pain, breathe around the pain. All the various steps we've talked about for dealing with pain. And that way your mind is not overcome by it. At the same time, when the pleasure comes in the concentration, you have to learn how not to be overcome by the pleasure. You just sit here wallowing and how good it feels. It's not going to feel good very long, because the cause for that good feeling comes from the fact that you are alert, paying careful attention to the breath. If you lose that foundation, either you go into delusion concentration, which is pleasant, but it, it's kind of like falling asleep. Or else the feeling of pleasure just goes away. So to maintain that feeling of pleasure, you have to remember, focus on the causes and don't just run off with the pleasure. All too many people are like someone who gets a job, and then you get your first paycheck, and then you quit the job, and you go off and spend the money. And you come back and you ask for the job back. Unfortunately, the, the boss is is kind-hearted, so that's your back. But if you keep this up, you're never going to get an advance in the job. Concentration teaches you how to be with pleasure and not be overcome by it. So this way you have a refuge from your past karma, a refuge from your urges to create unskillful karma in the present moment. But even then, as the Buddha said, you're still in that world that goes up and down.
then you're still subject to the fact that your mind could change. This is why you need something more solid. This is what the Noble Eightfold Path provides. It's the karma that leads to the end of karma. It takes the mind to a place that really is secure. Where you step outside of time, you step outside of space. Nothing is being done in that dimension. No old karma can reach in there, no new karma is being created. And it's the ultimate happiness. It's the ultimate security, the ultimate safety, the ultimate refuge. It's a refuge that lies beyond not only unskillful karma, past and present, but also skillful karma. That's where you're really safe. And this possibility is open for everybody. Whether there's a pandemic or no pandemic, social unrest or no social unrest, we can train the mind in this way and not let it be influenced by the things around us. This is the most important part of this. As the Buddha said, the greatest blessing is a mind that, when touched by the dhammas of the world, remains unshaken. The dhammas of the world are what? Gain, loss, status, loss of status, praise, criticism, pleasure, pain. Most people, when they're touched by these things, are bowled over. But a mind truly free of defilement doesn't quiver or shake at all. Venerable Sona, one of the, the Arhat disciples of the Buddha, gave the image of a stone column, sixteen spans tall, eight spans buried in the ground, solidly established, that no matter which direction the winds came from, the north, south, east, west, Northeast, southeast, southwest, northwest. That column didn't shake. And then when you have a mind like that, you really are secure. That's where your true safety lies. That's one of the reasons why one of the epithets for nirvana is refuge. It's refuge on the highest level. And we get there by starting with refuge on the external level, really listening to the Buddha, listening to the Dharma and the Sangha. As the Buddha said in his second knowledge, he saw beings of the world being reborn in line with their actions. Actions were shaped by their intentions. Their intentions were shaped by their views, and their views were shaped by who they listened to, who they respected. So be very careful about who you respect, who you listen to, because there are a lot of Dharma teachers out there, quote unquote, who don't really respect the Noble Ones anymore. They have other ideas, other agendas, and that's among Dharma teachers, to say nothing of the rest of the world. So tune into the the channel of the Triple Gem. Be careful of tuning into other channels. Always keep in mind the example set by the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Develop mindfulness to bring it inside, to embed it within you. And you have hope for discovering that ultimate level of refuge. where you no longer need help from anybody outside at all.